My name is Gary Sweeten. I'm an associate professor in the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Arizona State University. Uh, the title of the article uh, that was just came out is Age and the Explanation of Crime Revisited, and it came out in the Journal of Youth and Adolescence. Well, one of the basic facts of criminology is the relationship between age and crime. Um, as far back as 100 years ago or even more, uh, this relationship has exhibited itself. Um, essentially, uh, crime peaks around age 17, 18. There's a rapid increase in the teenage years up to that point, and then almost as rapid of a decline after that point, and continued declines uh, throughout the life course. In the people in their 40s commit less crime than in their 30s and so on. Um, so, um, in 1983, the seminal article in Criminology on Age and Crime was published by Hershey and Gopherson. And in it, they made several claims about the relationship between age and crime. One is that it is inv invariant. Um, and that means that it doesn't change. It's always the same. It's the same across cultures. It's been the same across time. It's the same across demographic groups, um, and so that's their, their invariant hypothesis. The other one is that it, it, there's a, the non-interactive hypothesis, that the causes of crime are the same at all ages. So if you determine something that causes crime at age 15, it'll be the same thing that causes crime at age 30 or 40. Uh, this ties in with their later theory uh, that they produced in 1990, suggesting that self-control causes most variation in crime at all ages. Lastly, the thing that we test is the inexplicability hypothesis. So noting this invariance of the relationship between age and crime across culture, across time, they suggested that the effect of age on crime is, in, is direct. That age affects crime directly and we do not have any sociological or psychological explanation available to us to account for that effect. We looked at a data set called Pathways to Desistance, um, which was a longitudinal study conducted in Phoenix, Arizona and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, it follows uh, youths who were involved with the criminal justice system uh, for seven years with ten follow-ups. Uh, and the unique aspect of this data set that really um, sparked our interest in using it for this study was the breadth of information that is measured at each wave. Uh, so we were able to control for 40 different things that are changing uh, across these uh, seven years. Well, the advantage of this data set is that all the youths were involved in the, in the criminal justice system, so they, they do have a healthy uh, uh, amount of uh, crime that they're committing, um, which you need if you want to study changes in crime. Uh, well, we looked at several different types of theories. Um, one of the most popular explanations for um, changes across the life course in crime is, is, life, is a social control theory. Uh, so we looked at changes such as getting a job, uh, getting married, um, changes in romantic involvement, um, changes in schooling. Um, so all of these fall under the, the um, realm of social control theory. Um, that's just one aspect of what we looked at. We also looked at uh, changes in delinquent peers, um, which is another of the, the most uh, prominent explanations for why crime changes with age. We looked at psychosocial aspects, um, cognitive uh, functioning because um, we know that um, there are changes in the brain occurring up to age 25. Uh, we also looked at r rational choice theory, the costs and benefits of crime as perceived by, by these youths, and if those change over time. Um, and we looked at all these simultaneously. And what we're trying to see is, um, starting, starting from the age crime curve that we see in these data, what would happen if you took all those variables and held them constant. Um, how much of a decline in crime would you see? Uh, and that would be the direct effect of, of age on crime. The goal was um, to eliminate that effect, to fully explain the effect of age on crime. We weren't able to fully do that, but we were able to explain over two-thirds of uh, the drop in crime 
from ages 15 to, to 25 using these, these 40 variables. Well, interestingly, it's not a single explanation. Um, in criminology, there's a lot of theories where you know, it points to one explanation for changes in, in uh, crime. Gofferson and Hersey, Hershey say it's just self-control. Others say, no, it's just changes in social bonds. No, it's just changes in uh, strain. We found significant explanations for the changes in crime from all the theories we tested, every one of them. Um, and so I would say that lots of things change. Um, one of the strongest explanations was changes in, in delinquent peer association, but uh, there were significant predictors from all the theories we tested. And um, given that there's still about 30% of the drop that we didn't explain, um, we know that there's lots of other changes that are going on that we didn't measure. Um, so that gives us hope for future studies that may be able to fully explain uh, the effect of age on crime. Um, well, what we did is we broke it up by perspective, by type of theory. Um, so we did models uh, separately for each kind of uh, type of explanation. We did a single model for, for social learning theory in which um, the delinquent peers explanation would reside and, and quantified how much of the age crime curve was explained by just that theory. So for the social learning theory, um, we were explaining 50% of the drop just with that theory alone. Um, when we looked at strain theory, we were explaining 40% of the drop. Now these are, these are correlated, so when you control for everything, you don't, it doesn't add up, you know, obviously, because there's covariance between them. But um, in this way, we were able to rank the different perspectives and say, okay, the social learning perspective has a lion's share of the explanation, next strain, next uh, psychosocial um, theories, um, the next social control. Well, I think where we go from here, we go from here in a number, we move forward from this study in a number of different, uh, different ways. First, in terms of research, I think there's room for improvement. Uh, we could have tested the theories that we included uh, more inclusively. Um, we could test other changes that occur, um, direct measures of, of changes in brain development. Um, there's lots of different lots of different realms of change that we did not control for. Um, and then it's also a story of hope for um, interventions. So if you know what's changing as people age, maybe you could encourage that change to occur more quickly uh, and try to encourage people to decline in crime uh, earlier or to peak in crime less. <laughs> Well, it's kind of a complicated story. We don't point to one single thing that, that causes crime, so there's no silver bullet. Um, lots of things are changing, uh, so the approach to trying to uh, reduce crime should be multifaceted. Um, should have, you know, you should focus on delinquent peer association, social bonds, strain, psychosocial functioning, all, all these different things at the same time. Well, I suspected that we would, we might be able to fully explain the age effect. Given the breadth of variables that we were looking at, I thought there's a good chance we, we, could, uh, we could knock out the age effect. Um, so that kind of surprised me, actually, that, that there's still a direct effect of age despite all the things that we controlled for. Uh, so to me, it just, it's a call for more research. It's a call to, to better understand what's going on. Um, the challenge is finding a data set such as this one that has that many explanations, uh, that many th you know, things that it measures um, repeatedly over time. Um, there's very few data sets that, that do that.